CSE Volume 1, Chapter 11, Corporations and Their Financial Statements. Chapter Overview. In this chapter, you will learn about the three types of business structures with a particular focus on the corporate structure. You will then learn about the various types of financial statements that corporations use to track their financial position and performance. In the context of public corporations, you will learn the rules of disclosure and the statutory rights of investors. Finally, you will learn the regulations around takeover bids and insider trading. There are six main content areas in this chapter. Corporations and their structure, financial statements of a corporation, the annual report, public company disclosures and investor rights, and takeover bids and insider trading. All of the key terms and definitions will be shared at the end of this chapter. Introduction the investment potential of a corporation's securities depends on the company's future performance, which can be difficult to forecast precisely. However, past performance often provides a clue. Therefore, an investor with some knowledge of a company's present financial position and past financial record is more likely to make a wise investment decision. Of course, the investor must also understand the industry in which the company operates, the economy in general, and the specific plans and prospects of the company in question to make a sound selection from investment alternatives. Whether you are an investor, advisor, or analyst, you must approach a corporation's financial statements as an investigator. Becoming familiar with the information presented in the financial statements is a first step toward making informed investment decisions. Those statements are one of the best ways that a company can communicate the success and challenges it has experienced to the investing public. In this chapter, we discuss the different types of financial statements that corporations use and the various components that make up each type. We also examine several aspects of corporations in general, including the corporate structure itself and the various rules and regulations under which corporations operate. Corporations and their structure. A corporation is a distinct legal entity separate from the people who own its shares. An incorporated business pays taxes and can sue or be sued in a court of law. Property acquired by the corporation does not belong to the shareholders of the corporation, but to the corporation itself. The shareholders have no liability for the debts of the corporation and there can be no additional levy on shareholders if the debts of a bankrupt corporation exceed the value of its realizable assets. Although corporations are the focus of this chapter, you should also be familiar with the other business structures, including sole proprietorship and partnerships. In a sole proprietorship, one person runs the business and is taxed on earnings at his or her personal income tax rate. The owner profits if the venture is successful, but is also personally liable for all debts, losses, and obligations arising from business activities. In other words, there is no distinction between personal assets and assets held in the business. In a partnership, two or more persons run the business, the structure of which is legislated under the Partnership Act. Partnerships can be general or limited. With a general partnership, both or all general partners run the day-to-day -day operations and are personally liable for all debts and obligations incurred in the course of business. With a limited partnership, general partners run the business while limited partners cannot participate in daily business activities. The limited partner's ability is limited to the amount of their investments. Unlike sole proprietorships and partnerships, corporations are able to raise funds by issuing equity or debt and are thus more suitable for large business ventures. Advantages and Disadvantages of Incorporation The advantages and disadvantages of incorporation are summarized below. Limited Shareholder Liability The shareholders of a corporation risk only the amount of money they have invested in the corporation's common shares. For example, a shareholder who has invested $1,000 in a corporation's common shares is not liable for additional contributions even if the corporation were to go bankrupt and have obligations to creditors that exceed the value of its realizable assets. Continuity of Existence A corporation's continued existence is not affected by the death of any or all of its shareholders. Its existence is terminated only by imposed acts such as bankruptcy of the corporation itself. A corporation is unlike a sole proprietorship, which ends when the proprietor dies. It also differs from a partnership, which terminates upon the death or withdrawal of one partner, unless an agreement to the contrary exists. Transfer of Ownership Shareholders of a public corporation can usually transfer their shares to other investors with relative ease. This liquidity is an attractive feature of share ownership. And although the ownership of shares may change, the assets of the corporation continue to be owned by the corporate entity itself. Ability to Finance 
Raising capital by issuing different classes of shares and debt instruments is much easier for corporations than for sole proprietorships or partnerships. Limited liability means that investors can contribute capital with a chance of return and without risk beyond the amount of investment. Growth. Corporations are structured to easily handle the large amounts of capital needed to operate large and growing businesses. Professional management. The shareholders are the ultimate owners of the corporation, but they play a very small part in its management. Through their voting rights, they elect a board of directors to manage corporate affairs. If the directors do not manage the corporation to their satisfaction, the shareholders may elect different directors. Disadvantages of incorporation Inflexibility A corporation is subject to many rules imposed by various statutes. Changes in the charter and bylaws of the corporation can be complicated and sometimes require formal approval of the government of the incorporating jurisdiction as well as of the directors and shareholders. Taxation The possibility of double taxation arises when the after-tax profits of a corporation are distributed in the form of dividends to shareholders, who themselves pay tax on their dividend income. Expense After the initial cost of incorporation, Annual costs apply that are additional to those incurred in proprietorships or partnerships. Some of those costs include annual returns, audits, preparation of federal and provincial corporate tax returns, the holding of shareholder meetings, and, for many corporations, securities laws. Capital withdrawal. Corporations must carefully follow statutory procedures for the purchase and redemption of shares by the corporation when permitted by the applicable statute. However, relatively minor investors in a public corporation can withdraw their capital simply by selling their shares on the market. Private and public corporations. Corporations can either be private or public. Private corporations have charters that restrict the rights of shareholders to transfer shares, limit the number of shareholders to no more than 50, and prohibit members from inviting the public to subscribe for their securities. Public corporations are companies whose shares are listed on a stock exchange or traded over the counter. Corporate bylaws. A corporation, whether private or public, is regulated by the federal or provincial act under which its charter is issued, by the charter itself and by various bylaws. A general bylaw is prepared at the time of incorporation and contains rules that govern the conduct of the corporation. The bylaws are passed by the board of directors and approved by the shareholders. Provisions in the bylaws usually deal with the following types of issues. Shareholders and directors meetings. Qualification, election, and removal of directors. Appointment, duties, and remuneration of officers. Declaration and payment of dividends. Date of fiscal year end. Signing authority for documents. Voting rights. The common shareholders of a publicly traded company have certain rights based on their equity investment in the company. A very important right is the opportunity to vote on certain company matters at annual meetings and at special or general meetings. Shareholders can vote in the election of the board of directors who guide and control the business operations of the corporation through its officers. Shareholders can also vote on corporate matters such as the sale, merger, or liquidation of the business, as well as decisions regarding a stock split or the amendment of the corporation's charter. Shareholders may also have the right to vote on executive compensation packages. Shareholders' Meetings The list of eligible shareholders is prepared and is effective as of a certain date prior to a regular or annual shareholder meeting. Shareholders are then notified of the meeting within a specified time period. At the annual meeting, they elect the directors, appoint the independent auditors or accountants, receive the financial statements and the auditors or accountants' report for the preceding year, and consider other matters regarding the company's affairs. To vote at the annual meeting, shareholders must have shares registered in their own name or else they must be in possession of a completed proxy form. Voting by proxy. Corporations see the annual shareholders meeting as an opportunity to report on their activities to their shareholders. Before the meeting, shareholders receive a proxy statement that outlines what is to be voted on at the meeting. Every shareholder who is registered on a company's books as owning shares is entitled to vote at the company's annual general meeting. Although shareholders are generally encouraged to attend the annual shareholders' meeting and vote in person, most retail investors cast their votes by proxy. The proxy is typically a member of the company's management team who is given authority through power of attorney to vote according to the shareholders' intentions. The shareholder indicates those intentions on a proxy statement or proxy form. 
The proxy statement must accompany the notice of a shareholder's meeting along with an information circular informing the shareholder of issues for consideration at the annual meeting. Such issues including details about proposed directors, directors and officers remuneration, interest of directors and officers in material transactions, the appointment of auditors, and particulars of other matters to be acted upon at the meeting. The proxy statement must be completed in writing and signed by the shareholder granting the proxy. If a shareholder does not vote or leaves the items on the proxy statement unmarked, the ballot is automatically cast with management's viewpoint. Therefore, it is important for shareholders to read the resolutions carefully and make their intentions clear. In many public corporations, the management group itself does not own a large percentage of the issued shares and may depend on the support of the shareholders at large. At the annual shareholders' meetings, Enough shareholders normally sign proxy forms appointing management nominees as their proxy, so that management is able to carry any resolution it wishes. However, in some circumstances, a contest might arise for control of the corporation. In such cases, both the management group and the challengers actively seek proxy support from the shareholders at large before the meeting. Although such conflicts are rare, they can lead to the removal of the existing management if enough shareholders lend support to the challengers. To dive deeper, you can view a sample proxy statement by visiting the website of the System for Electronic Document Analysis and Retrieval at cedar.com, S-E-D-A-R.com. There, you can access a database that contains public companies' proxy statements, which have been filed with the securities regulators. Did you know? Shares are most often registered in the name of a bank, investment dealer, or the CDS Clearing and Depository Services, rather than in the name of the true beneficial owner of the shares. In such cases, the institution in whose name the securities are registered is the nominee. Nominees must make sure that all beneficial owners are notified of meetings and that they receive voting instruction forms and other shareholder information. Voting Trusts A corporation that is undergoing a restructuring because of financial difficulties may be placed under the control of a few individuals through a voting trust. The voting trust is usually put into effect for specific periods or until certain results have been achieved. This measure is used because financiers may be willing to inject new capital only if they can be assured of control to protect their investment until the corporation recovers. To transfer voting control, shareholders are asked to deposit their shares with a trustee, usually a trust company, under the terms of a voting trust agreement. The trustee issues a voting trust certificate which returns to the shareholder the same rights possessed by the original shares. Voting privileges, however, remain with the trustee. The Corporate Structure a typical corporate structure at the executive level is illustrated in the figure 11.1. The various members at the top of the corporate structure have the following responsibilities. Directors. Directors must be of the age of majority and of sound mind. A director must not be an undischarged bankrupt person. They set company policies by passing resolutions. They normally appoint and supervise officers and signing authorities for banking, budget approval, financing, and plans for expansion. They are normally responsible for the decision to issue shares and declare dividends and other dispositions of profits. They are personally liable for illegal acts of the corporation done with their knowledge and consent. They are personally responsible for employee wages, declared dividends, and government remittances. They must act honestly, in good faith, and in the best interests of the corporation. Chairman of the Board The Chairman of the Board is elected by the Board of Directors. Persons in this position may have all or any of the duties of the president or any other officer of the corporation. They may be the chief executive officer. They preside over meetings of the board and generally exert great influence on the management of the affairs of the corporation. Their job may be combined with that of president. President. The president is appointed by and responsible to the board of directors. Persons in this position exercise authority through the other officers and through the heads of departments or divisions. If the job of president is not combined with that of the chairman, the president may act as chairman in the latter's absence. Vice Presidents Vice Presidents are appointed by and responsible to the president. They lead specific areas of the corporation's operations, such as sales or finance. Officers Officers are appointed by the board of directors. They are corporate employees responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the business. Financial Statements of a Corporation the structure of a corporation helps us understand how the company functions in its day-to-day -day activity in the marketplace. 
However, the company's financial statements shows us the company's performance and how it changes over time. Before investing in any company's stocks or bonds, you should be able to interpret its financial statements correctly, analyze them effectively, and compare them with those of other companies. Canada has adopted the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, a globally accepted high-quality accounting standard used by public companies in more than 100 countries. The international standards are principles-based with a focus on detailed disclosure, whereas the GAAP accounting or GAAP accounting is a mix of rule and principles-based accounting. With rule-based accounting, specific procedures are rigidly observed. Financial statements prepared in this way are less ambiguous, but the process is more complex. It is also difficult to create rules that fit every situation. Principles-based accounting has more general guidelines and broader objectives. For example, IFRS requires corporations to provide extensive and detailed disclosure to explain why particular accounting treatments are used, and enough data to allow an investor to make an objective analysis. As a result, financial statements are more transparent and easier to compare to those of other Canadian publicly traded companies that use the international standards. Financial statements act as an assessment of the company's financial health and as an overview of its operations. They show what the company owns and how it was financed, as well as how much money it earned or lost over a given period, typically one year. We will now discuss the structure, components, and purposes of the various corporate financial statements and explain how they relate to each other. The Statement of Financial Position The Statement of Financial Position shows a company's financial position on a specific date. In annual reports, that date is the last day of the company's fiscal year. Many companies have a fiscal year end that corresponds with the calendar year, December 31st, but that is not a requirement. Banks and trust companies traditionally end their fiscal year on October 31st. Did you know? For banks and trust companies, October is the last month of each fiscal year, and November is the first month of their next fiscal year. The statement of financial position shows three items. Assets consists of what the company owns and what is owed to it. Equity represents the shareholder's interest in the company. And liabilities are what the company owes. Equity is also referred to as the book value of the company. It represents the excess of the company's assets over its liabilities. Accordingly, the company's total assets are equal to the sum of equity plus the company's liabilities. The company's financial position can be expressed as an equation in two ways as shown below, where total assets equals total equity plus total liabilities, or total assets subtract total liabilities equals total equity. A statement of financial position is prepared and presented in more or less the same way for all Canadian publicly traded companies. Appendix A, at the end of this chapter, displays the financial statements of the fictional company TransCanada Retail Stores Limited as an example. The relationship between items on that company's statement of financial position is shown in Table 11.1. The total assets are $19,454,000, the total equity is $13,306,000, and the total liabilities is 6148000 Using the two formulas for the statement of financial position as noted above, we can express the financial position of TransCanada retail stores as follows. $19,454,000 is equal to $13,306,000 plus $6,148,000. Or, we can take $19,454,000 subtract $6,148,000 equals the 13306000 Did you know? Equity represents the total value of a company's assets that shareholders would theoretically receive if the company were liquidated. However, this item does not necessarily indicate the amount that shareholders would actually receive for their ownership interest in the event of sale. The market value of the shareholders' interest could be worth more or less than the book value, largely depending on the company's earning power and prospects. We will now explain each category of the Statement of Financial Position for the company TransCanada Retail Stores Limited in the order that it appears in Appendix A. Classification of Assets Assets are classified on a Statement of Financial Position as current and non-current. Non-current assets include property, plant and equipment, or PP&E, goodwill, and other intangible assets, and investments in associates. They are shown as items 1 to 3 on the TransCanada Retail Statement of Financial Position. Property, Plant, and Equipment 
The category of PP&E consists of land, buildings, machinery, tools, and equipment of all kinds, trucks, furnishings, and other items used in the day-to-day -day operations of a business. A company's PP&E is valuable because it is used directly in producing the goods and services the company eventually sells. Unlike current assets, which are consumed or converted by successive steps into cash, the items that make up a company's PP&E are not intended to be sold. Property, plant, and equipment, with the exception of land, wear out over time or otherwise lose their usefulness. Between the time that a given asset is acquired and the time when it is no longer economically useful, it decreases in value. This loss over a period of years is known as depreciation. Timber companies and other industries involved in resource extraction use the term depletion, which is similar to the term depreciation used by mining, oil, and natural gas. The assets of resource extraction industries consist largely of natural wealth such as minerals in the ground or standing timber. As these assets are developed and sold, the company loses part of its assets with each sale. Such assets are known as wasting assets, and depletion is the annual decrease in value the company records. In contrast, amortization is the term used to describe the gradual writing off of intangible assets such as patents or trademarks. Did you know? In calculating depreciation, items in the PP&E category are initially shown on the statement of financial position at original cost, including certain costs of acquisition, such as installation costs. Except for land, PP&E items are depreciated each year, in other words, reduced in value to reflect wear and tear, and the total accumulated depreciation is deducted from the original cost. To spread the cost of PP&E items over their years of useful service, companies record depreciation expenses in each year's statement of comprehensive income. PP&E items are used in the process of producing goods or services. Therefore, their depreciation is a cost of doing business, similar to wages and other expenses. The amount recorded as depreciation each year is based on the original cost of each asset, its expected useful life, and any residual value. Two commonly used methods of calculating depreciation are the straight line method and the declining balance method. The straight line method applies an equal amount to each period. This is the method used most frequently in Canada by public companies. The declining balance method applies a fixed percentage rather than a fixed dollar amount to the outstanding balance to determine the expense to be charged in each period. This amount is then deducted from the capital asset balance to determine the amount against which the percentage will be applied in the subsequent period, thus the term declining balance. The declining balance method typically uses some multiple of the straight line rate. The equation used for the straight line method is shown in figure 11.2. So the annual depreciation expense is equal to the original value, subtract the residual value, divided by the expected life. Where the original value is equal to the cost of purchase, the residual value is the value at the end of useful life, and the expected life is the expected number of years of useful life. The two methods of calculating depreciation are compared in the example below. So the straight line method a piece of equipment bought by XYZ Co. Limited at $100,000 is expected to have a useful life of 8 years and a residual value of $10,000 at the end of the asset's useful life. Using the straight line method, the annual depreciation for this asset is calculated as follows. $100,000 subtract $10,000 divided by the 8 years equals 11250 the depreciation rate is therefore 12.5% per year for each of the 8 years of expected usefulness. Now the declining balance method. So let's assume that XYZ instead chooses to use a depreciation rate of 25% under the declining balance method on each year's remaining balance. The calculation is as follows. In year 1, $100,000 depreciates at 25% which equals $25,000. In year 2, $75,000 depreciates at 25%, which equals $18,750. The annual calculations for each of these two methods are compared and illustrated in Table 11.2. Remember that the cost of the asset is $100,000, the residual value is $10,000, and its useful life is 8 years. The carrying amount shown in the table is the amount recorded each year on the Statement of Financial Position. Depreciation is intended to allocate the cost minus residual value of the company's PP&E over the useful lives of the assets. It provides a realistic matching of earnings to expenses in a fiscal period to determine a company's net or comprehensive income on an annual basis. 
The depreciation method, estimated life, and valuations must be reviewed each year according to the IFRS accounting system. Note that annual allowances for depreciation, depletion, and amortization appear as non-cash expenses in the Statement of Comprehensive Income. Therefore, it is quite possible for a company to add considerable amounts to its cash resources for the year and yet show little or no profit if substantial depreciation, depletion, or amortization charges were made. These effects are reflected in the Statement of Cash Flows, where the cash flows from operations is reported. An accounting activity called capitalization records an expenditure as an asset rather than an expense. The purpose of this activity related to depreciation is to spread the amount over more than one accounting period. When a company capitalizes an asset, profit in the year of acquisition is affected to a much lesser degree. Here's another example. So Ajax Incorporated purchases a piece of machinery for $10 million. Instead of recording the purchase as an expense on the Statement of Comprehensive Income, the company records it as an asset on the Statement of Financial Position. As an asset, its value then depreciates over a number of years. If the company had recorded the $10 million cost on its Statement of Comprehensive Income as an expense in the year it was incurred, the purchase would have had a substantial impact on the company's profit for that year. Under IFRS, fewer acquisition-related costs are allowed to be capitalized. Instead, they must be expensed in the year of acquisition. Goodwill and Other Intangible Assets Goodwill is often defined as the probability that a regular customer of a company will continue to do business with that company because of its location or its reputation for fair dealing and good products. People in the habit of doing business with a firm are likely to continue that habit even when the firm changes hands. For that reason, a buyer of a business is often willing to pay for the good name of that business or for its continued good management in addition to the value of its assets. Goodwill appears on the purchasing company's statement of financial position as the excess of the amount paid for the shares over their net asset value. Intangible assets are non-monetary assets that do not have physical substance. They can be sold, licensed, or transferred, but they usually decline greatly in value when a company is liquidated. Some common examples are patents, copyrights, franchises, and trademarks. In general, the value given to intangible assets on the statement of financial position should be viewed with caution. Their value is connected more to their contribution to earnings power than to their saleability as assets. For example, a trademark may have worth to a business in terms of brand recognition, yet its dollar value would be difficult to assess if it were to be sold on its own. Investment in associates refers to the degree of ownership that a company has in another company. As a general rule, significant influence is presumed to exist when a company owns at least 20%, but less than half of the voting rights of the other company. Current assets, as shown as items 5 to 8 on the TransCanada Retail Statement of Financial Position. Current assets are assets that will be realized, consumed, or sold in the normal course of business, typically within one year. They include inventory, prepaid expenses, and trade receivables, as well as cash and cash equivalents. Current assets are the most important group of assets because they largely determine a firm's ability to pay its day-to-day -day operating expenses. Inventory. Inventory consists of the goods and supplies that a company keeps in stock. For example, a furniture manufacturer that sells chairs to TransCanada Retail would have inventories of raw materials, the fabric and the wood used to build the chairs, work in progress, the assembled chair frames, and finished goods, the completed chairs ready for shipping. Inventories are changed into cash through successive steps as raw materials are processed into finished goods. Finished goods sold on credit rather than for cash give rise to trade receivables, which are eventually paid off in cash. This process goes on day after day, providing the funds to enable the company to pay for wages, raw materials, taxes, and other expenses. Ultimately, inventories provide the profits out of which dividends may be paid to shareholders. Inventories are valued at original cost or net realized value, whichever is lower. You can think of net realizable value as the expected sale price less the cost associated with selling the asset. The following two methods are commonly used to determine the value of inventories at original cost. The weighted average method uses the average of the total cost of the goods purchased over the period on a per unit basis. The first in first out or FIFO method implies that items acquired earliest are assumed to be used or sold first. 
Example, a computer company manufactured 1,000 hard drives last month at a cost of $125 each, and an additional 1,000 units this month at a cost of $150 each. The higher costs relate to rising raw materials prices. The company sells 1,000 hard drives today. Under the first in first out method, the inventory is valued as follows. The cost of the goods is $125 per hard drive because that was the cost of each of the first hard drives into inventory. The remaining hard drives are valued at the more recent and higher cost of $150 each, which works out to an inventory value of $150,000. Under the weighted average method, the inventory is valued as follows. The total cost of the hard drives is $275,000, which is 1,000 times 125 and 1,000 times 150, and you add those together to get 275,000. The cost of the goods sold is $137.5 per hard drive, which is the $275,000 inventory total divided by the 2,000 units. The inventory value reported on the statement of financial position for the 1,000 units that are still left is 137,500. As shown in the above example, if prices are changing, each of these methods produces a different inventory value on the statement of financial position. Consequently, the two methods show a different profit based on the cost of the goods sold. As you will learn when we discuss the statement of comprehensive income later in this chapter, a lower cost of goods sold results in higher profits for the company. Prepaid expenses. Prepaid expenses are payments made by the company for services to be received in the near future. Prepaid expenses are the equivalent of cash because they eliminate the need to pay cash for goods or services in the immediate future. Nevertheless, IFRS treats these expenses as an entry separate from cash and cash equivalents. Rents, insurance premiums, and taxes when paid in advance are examples of prepaid expenses. Trade receivables. The trade receivables category represents money owing to a company for goods or services it has sold. Because some customers fail to pay their bills, an item called allowance for doubtful accounts is often subtracted from receivables. This allowance is management's estimate of the amount that will not be collected. The net amount of trade receivables is shown on the statement of financial position as trade receivables minus the allowance for doubtful accounts. Cash and cash equivalents. The cash and cash equivalents category represents cash on hand, funds in the company's bank accounts, or funds held in short-term investments. These items hold minimal risk of a change in value and are readily convertible into cash. Classification of equity. We now turn our attention to the various categories of equity shown in the statement of financial position. The items in this section represent shareholders' equity, which is the amount that shareholders have at risk in the business. This category includes share capital, retained earnings, and non-controlling interest, which are shown on the statement of financial position as items 11 to 13. So item 11, share capital. Share capital is the money paid in by shareholders. This is the amount received by the company for its shares at the time that they were issued. Therefore, the share capital shown on the statement of financial position is not related in any way to the current market price of the outstanding shares. Share capital does not change from year to year unless the company issues new shares or buys back outstanding shares. Item 12, retained earnings. Retained earnings represent the profits earned over time that have not been paid out as dividends. In other words, the portion of annual earnings retained by the company after payments of all expenses and the distribution of all dividends. The earnings retained each year are reinvested in the business. The reinvestment of accumulated earnings may be held in cash or reinvested in inventories, property, or any other of the company's assets. If a company suffers a loss in any year, the loss is deducted from the retained earnings. In this event, each shareholder's ownership interest in the company is reduced because the retained earnings amount has been reduced. If more losses than earnings accumulate, the result is a deficit. Item 13. Non-controlling interest. Non-controlling interest appears as a category when a company owns more than 50% of a subsidiary company and consolidates its financial statements. In other words, the company combines all the assets, liabilities, and operating accounts of the parent company with those of its subsidiary or subsidiaries into a single joint statement. Even when the parent company owns less than 100% of a subsidiary stock, all of the subsidiary's assets and liabilities are combined into the consolidated financial statements. However, the part of the subsidiary that is not owned by the parent company is shown in the statement of financial position as non-controlling interest. 
This item is the interest or ownership that outsiders have in the subsidiary company. Under IFRS, non-controlling interest is presented separately from the parent company's shareholders' equity. Classification of liabilities. As with assets, liabilities are classified on the statement of financial position as current and non-current. Items 15 and 16 are non-current liabilities. Non-current liabilities include long-term debt and deferred tax liabilities. The long-term debt of a company is debt that is due in annual installments over a period of years or else in a lump sum in a future year. The most common of these debts are mortgages, bonds, and debentures. Frequently, capital assets classified as PP&E are pledged as security for such borrowings. Any portion of long-term debt that is due within the current year is shown as a current item. It is customary to describe long-term debt items in the notes to the financial statements. Notes must be detailed enough to tell the reader what kind of security is provided on the loan, what interest rate is carried, when the debt becomes repayable, and what sinking fund provision, if any, is made for repayment. The Deferred Tax Liabilities category represents income tax payable in future periods. These liabilities commonly result from temporary differences between the book value of assets and liabilities as reported on the Statement of Financial Position and the amount attributed to that asset or liability for income tax purposes. The difference between these two amounts is multiplied by a future tax rate to arrive at the tax amount owing for the period. Items 18-21 to 21, Current Liabilities For the most part, Current liabilities are debts incurred by a company in the ordinary course of business that must be paid within the company's normal operating cycle, typically one year. So the four current liabilities are the current portion of long-term debt due in one year, taxes payable to the government in the near term, trade payables like unpaid bills for items such as raw materials and supplies, and short-term borrowings from financial institutions. Did you know? When calculating a company's debt ratios, like we do in Chapter 14 in Volume 2, it is important to distinguish between debts such as short-term borrowings and bonds and other types of liabilities such as trade payables and taxes owed. Only debts incurred by borrowing are included in ratios involving debt. Statement of Comprehensive Income The Statement of Comprehensive Income shows how much money a company earned during the year compared to how much money it spent. The difference between the two amounts is the company's profit or loss for the year, out of which dividends may be paid to the shareholders. The Statement of Comprehensive Income reveals the following information about a company. Where earnings come from, where earnings go, the adequacy of earnings both to assure the successful operation of the company and to provide income for the holders of its securities. Did you know, when analyzing the financial condition of a company, its earning power and cash flow are of primary interest, the proof of a company's financial strength and security lies in its ability to generate earnings and, through those earnings, cash flow. Evidence of the adequacy of these items is provided by both the Statement of Comprehensive Income and the Statement of Cash Flows. Structure of the Statement of Comprehensive Income The first section of the Statement of Comprehensive Income typically has three parts, revenue, cost of sales, and gross profit. Simply put, gross profit is the amount remaining after the cost of sales is subtracted from revenue. After gross profit is determined, other income is added and general expenses are subtracted to arrive at total comprehensive income. So items 24 to 26 is the revenue, cost of sales, and gross profit. Revenue is a key figure in the statement of comprehensive income. It consists of income made from the sale of products or services. For example, if the company is a public utility, it derives income from the sale of gas or electricity. Revenue is the figure needed to calculate various ratios such as net and gross profit margins that are used to determine the soundness of a company's financial position. These ratios are used by credit managers, bankers, and security analysts in making a detailed investigation of a company's financial affairs. Cost of sales. Expenses that arise in producing the income received from the sale of the company's products or services are deducted from revenue. The first such deduction in the case of a manufacturing or merchandising business is termed cost of sales. This item includes cost of labor, raw materials, fuel and power, supplies and services, and other kinds of expenses that go directly into the cost of manufacturing, or in the case of a merchandising company, expenses that go directly into the cost of goods purchased for resale. Although all statements of comprehensive income provide the same financial information, a company can use one of the following two formats depending on how expenses are disclosed. By nature of their use, examples depreciation, raw materials and employee benefits, or by function, 
cost of sales, administrative, and distribution. In our example in Appendix A, the TransCanada Retail Statement of Comprehensive Income discloses expenses by function. Gross Profit After deducting the cost of sales from the amount of revenue, we have the company's gross profit figure for that period. This figure is significant because it measures the margin of profit or spread between the cost of goods produced for sale and revenue. When the percentage of gross profit to revenue is calculated and compared with those of other companies engaged in the same line of business, it provides an indication of whether the company's merchandising operations are more or less successful in producing profits than its competitors. Between different companies in the same business, differences in the margin of gross profit generally reflect differences in managerial ability. Item 27 is other income. So generally, a company has two main sources of income, revenue and other income. Revenue is derived from the sale of products or services, whereas other income is not directly related to a company's normal operating activities. This category includes dividends and interest from investments, rents, and sometimes profits from the sale of PP&E. Good accounting practice requires that revenue and other income be shown separately in the Statement of Comprehensive Income, especially if the other income is substantial. It is important to separate the two categories, otherwise it would be impossible to gain a true picture of the company's real earning power based on its main operations. For example, a company might realize a substantial profit from the sale of securities or some other asset in one year. However, a profit of this kind is not likely to be repeated the next year. To combine it with revenue would give a false impression of the company's earning power. Therefore, other income is added after gross profit is calculated. Items 28 to 31, general expenses. After other income is added to gross profit, the following general expenses are deducted. Distribution costs, including such expenses as advertising costs and salaries and commissions to sales personnel. Administrative expenses, including office salaries, accounting staff salaries, and office supplies. Other expenses not directly related to the company's normal operating activities, including expenses associated with the sale of PP&E. Finance costs in the form of interest payments on debt holders' securities or loans to the company. The distribution of income to creditors is usually made in the form of fixed interest charges to banks and other debt holders who have lent money to the company. These interest charges are paid out of income before taxes and are fixed in the sense that the amount of interest that has to be paid on borrowed money is definite. For example, if the company has $1 million worth of bonds outstanding in the hands of investors and these bonds bear interest at the rate of 9% per annum, the interest to be paid each year is a fixed amount of $90,000. Interest charges are also fixed which means that they must be paid before any income is distributed to shareholders. A default in payment would give creditors the right to place the company in receivership and put the company at risk of bankruptcy. Item 32. Share of profit of associates. Share of profit of associates occurs when one company's investment in another company creates significant influence without gaining control and when each company has its own financial statements. The equity accounting method is used to capture the income received from the investment. Traditionally, a company has significant influence but falls short of control when it owns at least 20% but less than half of voting shares. Here's an example. TransCanada Retail Stores owns 25% of Alberta Retail Stores. Now Alberta Retail Stores earned $20,000 of profit after tax in a particular fiscal year. In its Statement of Comprehensive Income, TransCanada Retail Stores reports $5,000 of this amount as share of profit of associates. That is, the 25% ownership multiplied by the $20,000 of revenue equals the $5,000. The cost method of accounting is primarily used for ownership holdings that do not result in significant influence, traditionally ownership of less than 20%, and where investments in other companies are reported in the form of investments on the financial statements. Certain profit calculations must be adjusted for share of profit of associates because the company reports this income but does not actually receive it in cash. Therefore, share of profit of associates is a non-cash source of funds, just as depreciation, amortization, and depletion are non-cash uses of funds. Company profit must be reduced by the amount of share of profit of associates when calculating ratios when a true picture of the company's cash profit is required. If an entity under a company's significant influence experiences a loss, the company reports its share of the loss on its statement of comprehensive income. This entry is called share of loss of associates and reduces profit on the statement. 
As with share of profit of associates, a share of loss of associates is a non-cash item. The amount of the share of loss of associates must therefore be added back to the company's profit when calculating ratios to show a true picture of the company's cash profit. Moving on to item 33, income tax expense. Income tax expense includes both current tax and deferred tax for the time period. The notes to the company's financial statements provide additional information on this topic. Item 34, Profit. The next step in the Statement of Comprehensive Income is the calculation of profit or loss. This is the amount of profit from the year's operations that may be available for distribution to shareholders. Note, in our example in Appendix A, the section called Other Comprehensive Income has no entries. However, on another company's statement, this section might include the following items. Actuarial gains and losses on defined benefit plans. Gains and losses from currency translations relating to the financial statements of a foreign operation. The total comprehensive income, item 35, consists of the profit or loss plus the other comprehensive income. At this point, total comprehensive income is transferred to the Statement of Changes in Equity. The Statement of Changes in Equity is used to record changes to each component of equity, including share capital and retained earnings, which is items 11 and 12 on the Statement of Financial Position. It also records any changes in non-controlling interest, which is item 13 on the Statement of Financial Position. Retained Earnings Retained earnings are profits earned over the years that have not been paid out to shareholders as dividends. These retained profits accrue to the shareholders, but the directors have decided to reinvest them in the business for now. Retained earnings provide a record of the total comprehensive income kept in the business year after year. A portion of the total comprehensive income for the current year is added to, or in the event of a loss subtracted from, the balance of retained earnings shown in the Statement of Financial Position from the previous year. Dividends declared during the year are subtracted from retained earnings in the Statement of Changes in Equity. A new final retained earnings figure is determined and carried to the Statement of Financial Position where it appears in the Equity section, item 12. The Statement of Changes in Equity is important because it provides a link between the Statement of Comprehensive Income and the Statement of Financial Position. The Consolidated Statement of Changes in Equity also discloses the profit or loss to the non-controlling interests and to the parent company. Total Comprehensive Income The Statement of Changes in Equity shows the company's total comprehensive income in the form of retained earnings. It also shows the amount of total comprehensive income that is attributable to non-controlling interests. The total comprehensive income attributable to the owners of the company represents the total comprehensive income of the company minus the total comprehensive income attributable to the non-controlling interests. Here's an example. A company owns 80% of the shares of a subsidiary, and the subsidiary had total comprehensive income of $1 million last year. The subsidiary's total comprehensive income of $1 million is included in the total comprehensive income of the parent company. The Statement of Comprehensive Income shows $200,000 as income attributable to non-controlling interests, which represents the 20% of the subsidiary that is not owned by the parent company. Statement of Cash Flows as we discussed earlier, the Statement of Financial Position shows a company's financial position at a specific point in time, and the Statement of Comprehensive Income summarizes the company's operating activities for the year. Neither statement, however, shows how the company's financial position changed from one period to the next. The Statement of Cash Flows fills this gap by showing how the company generated and spent its cash during the year. The Statement of Cash Flows helps the reader to evaluate the liquidity and solvency of a company and assess its overall quality the assessment should address the following questions. Can the company pay its creditors, especially in business downturns? Can it fund its needs internally, if necessary? Can it reinvest while continuing to pay dividends to shareholders? A review of the statement of cash flows over a number of years may illustrate trends that might otherwise go unnoticed. This statement often provides a clearer picture of the viability of a company than does the statement of comprehensive income because it measures actual cash generated from the business. For the purposes of the statement of cash flows, the item cash and cash equivalents includes cash on hand or in the company's bank accounts, as well as short-term, highly liquid investments that are readily convertible into known amounts of cash with little risk of a change in value. The statement of cash flows details the changes in cash and cash equivalents and the reasons for those changes. Structure of the statement of cash flows. A statement of cash flows shows the company's cash flows for the period under the following three headings. Operating activities, financing activities, and investing activities. 
This statement also shows the increase or decrease in cash in the current fiscal year. So items 34 to 37, operating activities. The statement of cash flows begins by looking at those accounts that directly reflect the business activities of the company. These activities are actions that require an inflow or outflow of cash that generate sales and expenses during the year. The statement begins with profit, item 34. Added back to profit are all items not involving cash, such as depreciation and amortization. Share of profit of associates, item 32, is subtracted because it is not an actual cash transaction for the company. Item 37, change in net working capital, represents changes in the various asset and liability accounts that appear on the statement of financial position. Net working capital items include the following accounts, trade receivables, inventories, trade payables, interest payables, and taxes payable. The dollar amount of these accounts in the current year are compared to the same amounts in the previous year. The change in each account is then recorded in the statement of cash flows. Now, in our example in Appendix A, the previous year's financial statements are not provided, so the calculation of change in networking capital in item 37 is not shown in the text. Here's a different example. The trade receivables account at Ajax Incorporated records invoices that have been sent to customers but not yet paid. The company includes the sales and revenue but has not yet received the money. When the invoice is paid, the receivables account declines as the cash account increases. These changes must be tracked in the statement of cash flows to show an accurate picture of the company's position. For example, if trade receivables increases substantially in the current year, the company's sales revenue will be much higher than the amount of cash collected over the period. This discrepancy may require further investigation on the part of the analyst. It could indicate that the receivables department is poorly managed or that the company is extending credit to customers that are unable to pay. More importantly, a company needs a regular stream of cash flowing into the business to maintain its operations. If credit sales go uncollected for an extended period, the company may have difficulty paying its bills or meeting interest charges. The company may look good on paper because its revenues are up. However, as demonstrated by the Statement of Comprehensive Income, it may soon be in serious financial difficulty if it cannot generate enough cash to pay its creditors. Items 38 to 41, Financing Activities. Cash flows from financing activities involve transactions used to finance the company. If the company has issued new share capital in item 38 or debt in item 40, cash flows into the company. If the company repays debt in item 39 or pays dividends to the shareholders in item 41, cash flows out of the company. This section is of particular interest to the shareholders of the company because it highlights changes to a company's capital structure, the overall use of debt and equity financing. A substantial increase in debt or issuance of new shares may negatively affect the shareholders' equity in the company. Note, the dividends paid to shareholders could be placed in either the Operating Activities section or the Financing Activities section. The TransCanada Retail has chosen to place them in the Financing Activities section. Items 42 to 44, Investing Activities. Investing activities highlight what the company did with any money not used in its direct operation. This section includes any investments made in the company itself, such as the purchase of new capital assets in item 42, or disposal of such assets in item 43. As well, this part includes any dividends actually received from associates in item 44. Note, the dividends from associates could be placed in either the operating activity section or the investing activity section. In our TransCanada retail example, they have chosen to place them in the investing activities section. Our last two items, 45 and 46. The change in cash flow. The final section of the statement of cash flows sums up the cash flows from operating, investing, and financing activities to arrive at the increase or decrease in cash in item 45 for the current fiscal year. Because the statement of cash flows looks at the actual change in the cash position for the year, the final balance in cash and cash equivalents in item 46 comprises cash and cash equivalents found in the year end statement of financial position for TransCanada Retail in item 8. Ideally, the company should always have a positive net cash flow. If it does not, it is important to find out why. The IFRS accounting approach requires additional disclosures not normally seen with the Canadian GAAP approach. For example, the company should disclose whether the financial statements represent a single entity or a group of entities and whether the measurement basis is historical cost or fair value. These disclosures help the reader to understand the rationale behind the presentation of facts. The Annual Report 
A corporation's annual report is a publication for shareholders that provides an overview of the firm's finances and a review of its activities over the course of the previous year. Two important components of a company's annual report are the notes to financial statements and the auditor's report. Notes to the financial statements. A considerable amount of detailed information about a company's financial condition must be disclosed in the shareholder's interest. Much of this information is shown in a series of notes to the financial statements, rather than in the statements themselves. The company's notes include the following items. Its statement of compliance with IFRS, the accounting policies used, more detailed descriptions of fixed assets, share capital, and long-term debt, and commitments and contingencies. Potential investors should also look into the notes to ascertain whether the company uses derivatives for hedging or other purposes. The Auditor's Report Canadian corporate law requires that every limited company appoint an auditor to represent shareholders and report to them annually on the company's financial statements. The auditor must express an opinion in writing as to the fairness of those statements. The auditor is appointed at the company's annual meeting by a resolution of the shareholders and may also be dismissed by them. The only exception to this requirement is for privately held corporations where all shareholders have agreed that an audit is not necessary. Public Company Disclosures and Investor Rights Securities legislation in each of the provinces requires the continuous disclosure of certain prescribed information concerning the business and affairs of public companies. This disclosure usually consists of periodic financial statements, including management discussion and analysis, insider trading reports, information circulars required in proxy solicitation, the annual information form, press releases, and material change reports. The principle of disclosure is also evident in the requirements of the acts, regulations, and policy statements of most provinces covering a distribution of securities. Generally, every person or corporation that sells or offers to sell to the public securities that have not previously been distributed to the public or which come from a control position is required to file with and obtain the approval of the administrator in the province. The seller must deliver to the purchaser a prospectus containing full, true, and plain disclosure of all material facts related to the issue. Did you know, a control position refers to ownership of more than 20% of the voting stock in a company that is sufficient to materially affect its affairs. Continuous Disclosure A reporting issuer is a corporation that has issued securities to the public and must comply with the timely and continuous public disclosure requirements of the Securities Acts. The primary disclosure requirements include issuing a press release and filing a material change report with the administrators if a material change occurs. A material change is a change in the business, operations, or capital of an issuer that would reasonably be expected to have a significant effect on the market price or value of its securities. Issuers must also file with the administrators annual and interim financial statements that meet prescribed standards of disclosure. Companies are required to ensure that no confidential material information is selectively disclosed to third parties. Situations where such disclosure might occur include meetings with financial analysts and restricted conference calls with institutional investors. By taping all these discussions and reviewing the tapes immediately after all meetings or conference calls, a company can determine whether any previously undisclosed confidential material information was inadvertently disclosed. If it was, an immediate press release by one of its responsible officers should be released, and the appropriate regulators should be notified of the inadvertent disclosure. Most companies usually provide financial statements in the required form to all shareholders and send additional copies to the appropriate administrators. The financial disclosure provisions also require that shareholders and administrators be provided with the following information. Comparative audited annual financial statements should be sent within 120 days of the financial year end for companies listed on the TSX Venture Exchange or within 90 days for issuers on the TSX. Comparative unaudited quarterly interim financial statements should be sent within 60 days of the end of each of the first three quarters of the financial year for companies listed on the TSX Venture Exchange or within 45 days for issuers on the TSX. Statutory Rights of Investors The Canadian Securities Administrators have adopted a Statement of Withdrawal and Rescission Rights for Purchasers to be included in all prospectuses, National Instrument 41-101 General Prospectus Requirements. These rights can be summarized according to the conditions described below. Right of Withdrawal 
Securities legislation in all provinces provides purchasers with the right to withdraw from an agreement to purchase securities within two business days after receipt or deemed receipt of a prospectus or any amendment to the prospectus. The purchaser must give notice to the vendor or its agent. Where a distribution requiring a prospectus is completed without a prospectus, most provinces permit a purchaser who still owns the security to revoke the transaction, subject to the applicable time limits. In Quebec, the purchaser can apply for an adjustment of the purchase price. Right of Rescission Securities legislation gives purchasers the right to rescind or cancel a completed contract for the purchase of securities if the prospectus or amended prospectus offering the security contains a misrepresentation. This right is provided on condition that the action to enforce it is brought within the applicable time limits. In most provinces, a purchaser alleging misrepresentation must choose between the remedy of rescission and the alternative of damages. Right of Action for Damages The right of action for damages as granted by most securities legislation provides that an issuer and its directors and anyone who signs a prospectus may be liable for damages if the prospectus contains a misrepresentation. The same liability applies to an expert, such as an auditor, lawyer, geologist, or appraiser, whose report or opinion appears with his or her consent in a prospectus. Experts are only liable if the misrepresentation is with respect to their report or opinion. Legislation provides a number of defenses to an action for rescission or damages based on a misrepresentation. For example, if the underwriter or directors conducted a thorough enough investigation to provide reasonable grounds to believe that there has been no misrepresentation, they cannot be held liable. A defense is also available if the person or company can prove that the purchaser bought the securities with knowledge of the misrepresentation. Furthermore, securities legislation imposes certain limitations with respect to maximum liability as well as time limits during which an action may be brought. Takeover Bids and Insider Trading The securities legislation of most provinces contains provisions regulating takeover bids. This legislation is designed to safeguard the position of shareholders of a company that is the target of a takeover by ensuring that each shareholder has a reasonable opportunity and adequate information to consider the bid. Most provinces also require insiders of a reporting issuer to file reports of their trading in its securities. This requirement is based on the principle that shareholders and other interested persons should be regularly informed of the market activity of insiders. In addition, insiders who make use of undisclosed information must give an accounting of their profits and may be liable for damages. Takeover bids and insider trading are explained in detail below. Takeover bids. A takeover bid is an offer to purchase from a company's shareholders more than 20% of the outstanding voting securities of the company or a number of shares that, when combined with the offeror's existing shares, exceeds 20%. Outstanding voting securities are those voting shares that are owned by shareholders and are available for trading. In a takeover, the company or individual making the offer, if successful, obtains enough shares to control the targeted company. The definition of a takeover includes an offer to purchase, an acceptance of an offer to sell, and a combination of the two. A takeover bid must comply with provincial legislation unless it is exempted under the relevant act. Early Warning Disclosure Most provincial acts state that every person or company accumulating 10% or more of the outstanding voting securities of any class of a reporting issuer or securities convertible into such securities must issue a press release immediately. The press release and the report must include a statement of the purpose of the acquisition and any future intentions to increase ownership or control. After a formal bid is made for voting securities of a reporting issuer and before the expiry of the bid, every person or company acquiring 5% or more of the securities of the class subject to the bid must issue a press release reporting this information. And this, of course, is excluding the offerer under the bid. Insider Trading Here's the definition of insiders. For the purpose of disclosure, insiders generally include any of the following entities. The directors of the issuer. The senior officers of the issuer, who are defined as the chair or vice chair of the board of directors. The president, any vice president, the secretary, the treasurer or the general manager of the issuer, or any other individual who performs functions for the issuer similar to those normally performed by an individual occupying any such office, and each of the five highest paid employees of the issuer, including any individual referred to above. Any person or company, 
excluding underwriters in the course of public distribution, beneficially owning, directly or indirectly, or controlling or directing more than 10% of the voting rights attached to all voting securities, and any director or senior officer of a company that is a subsidiary of the issuer or is itself an insider due to ownership, control, or direction over more than 10% of the voting rights attached to all voting securities of the issuer involved. In some circumstances, if a corporation becomes an insider of a second corporation, an insider of the first corporation may be deemed to be an insider of the second corporation as well. When dealing with trades relating to securities of a company that has been involved in such transactions, care should be taken to ascertain whether the persons involved are deemed under the relevant legislation to be insiders. The Securities Acts and the Canada Business Corporations Act contain provisions that deem certain persons or companies that become insiders of an issuer to have been insiders of the issuer for a period of up to six months before the event. Insider Reporting Insiders must inform the relevant securities commissions when they become insiders and when they transact in securities of the company in which they are insiders. Reports must state the extent of the insider's direct or indirect beneficial ownership of or control or direction over securities of the company. Securities firms should be aware that most acts require an insider who transfers securities of a reporting issuer into the name of an agent, nominee, or custodian to file a report with the administrator. Transfers for the purpose of collateral for a debt are exempt from this rule. All reports filed with the administrator are open for public inspection and in some cases summaries are published in the administrator's regular publication. Failing to file an insider report, giving false information, or providing misleading information are offenses under the Acts and are usually punishable by a fine. Here's our summary for Chapter 11. In this chapter, we discuss the following key aspects of corporations and their financial statements. Unlike the owners of a sole proprietorship or partnership, a corporation's owners are not personally liable for debts, losses, or obligations arising from its business activities. A corporation is owned by its shareholders, but is taxed as a separate legal entity. Property of the corporation belongs to the corporation, not to the shareholders. Corporations can raise funds by issuing debt or equity. A corporation's financial statements show what the company owns, how it was financed, and how much money it earned or lost over a given period. The statement of financial position represents a snapshot of a company's operations at a specific date. The statement shows the book value of its assets, what the business owns, and liabilities, what the business owes, and equity, the claim on the company's assets by its owners. The statement of comprehensive income shows a company's profitability in terms of the revenue received from selling its products, the expenses incurred to generate the revenue, and the profit for the company. The statement of changes in equity records the profits kept in the business and provides a direct link with the statement of comprehensive income and the statement of financial position. The statement of cash flows shows how a company generated and spent its cash during the period and reports the net change in the cash account over the period. A corporation's annual report provides an overview of the firm's finances and a review of its activities over the course of the previous year. Notes to the financial statements in this report provide important details about the company's financial condition not reported in the actual financial statements. The auditor's report presents an independent opinion on the financial statements of the company being audited. After distributing securities to the public, a reporting issuer must comply with the timely and continuous public disclosure of information. Disclosure can include issuing a press release or filing a material change report when significant changes to the company's operations occur. Investors in the securities of a public company have three statutory rights. The right of withdrawal, the right of rescission, and the right to take legal action for damages. A takeover bid is an offer to purchase the shares of the company that will exceed 20% of the outstanding voting securities of the company. A takeover bid must comply with provincial legislation unless it is exempted under the relevant act. Likewise, any trading activity by insiders of a corporation is subject to regulations regarding reporting and disclosure. Key Terms and Definitions Found in Chapter 11 Corporations and Their Financial Statements Corporation or Company A form of business organization created under provincial or federal statutes which has a legal identity separate from its owners. The corporation's owners or shareholders have no personal liability for its debts. Sole Proprietorship 
a form of business organization that involves one person running a business whereby the individual is taxed on earnings at their personal income tax rate. Partnership, a form of business organization that involves two or more people contributing to the business and legislated under the Federal Partnership Act. Asset, everything a company or a person owns or has owed to it, a statement of financial position category. Equity, Ownership interest in a corporation stock that represents a claim on its revenue and assets. Private corporation. Companies that have charters that restrict the right of shareholders to transfer shares, limit the number of shareholders to no more than 50, and prohibit shareholders from inviting the public to subscribe for their securities. Public corporation. A company whose shares are listed on a stock exchange or traded over the counter. Proxy. Written authorization given by a shareholder to someone else who need not be a shareholder to represent him or her and vote his or her shares at a shareholder's meeting. Information circular. Documents sent to shareholders with a proxy, providing details of matters to come before a shareholder's meeting. Beneficial owner. The real or underlying owner of an account, securities, or other assets. An investor may own shares which are registered in the name of an investment dealer, trustee, or bank to facilitate transfer or to preserve anonymity, but the investor would be the beneficial owner. Nominee. A person or firm, like a bank, investment dealer, or CDS, in whose name securities are registered. The shareholder, however, retains the true ownership of the securities. Voting Trust. An arrangement to place the control of a company in the hands of certain managers for a given period of time or until certain results have been achieved by shareholders surrendering their voting rights to a trustee for a specified period of time. Trustee. For bondholders, usually a trust company appointed by the company to protect the security behind the bonds and to make certain that all covenants of the trustee relating to the bonds are honored. For a segregated fund, the trustee administers the assets of a mutual fund on behalf of the investors. International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, a globally accepted high-quality accounting standard already used by public companies in over 100 countries around the world. Statement of Financial Position, a financial statement showing a company's assets, liabilities, and equity on a given date. Liabilities, debts or obligations of a company, usually divided into current liabilities, those due and payable within one year, and long-term liabilities, those payable after one year. Book value, the amount of net assets belonging to the owners of a business or shareholders of a company based on statement of financial position values. It represents the total value of the company's assets that shareholders would theoretically receive if a company were liquidated. Also represents the original cost of the units allocated to a segregated fund contract. Non-current asset, assets which in the normal course of business would not be converted into cash. Non-current assets include property, plant, and equipment. Goodwill. Generally understood to represent the value of a well-respected business, its name, customer relations, employee relations, among others. Considered an intangible asset on the statement of financial position. Intangible asset. An asset having no physical substance, like goodwill, patents, franchises, copyrights. Investments in associates. The ownership a company has in another company. As a general rule, significant influence is presumed to exist when a company owns 20% or more of the voting rights of the other company. Current assets. Cash and assets, which in the normal course of business would be converted into cash, usually within a year, like accounts receivable or inventories. This is a statement of financial position category. Depreciation. Systematic charges against earnings to write off the cost of an asset over its estimated useful life because of wear and tear through use, action of the elements, or obsolescence. It is a bookkeeping entry and does not involve the expenditure of cash. Depletion. Refers to consumption of natural resources that are a part of a company's assets. Producing oil, mining, and gas companies deal in products that cannot be replenished and as such are known as wasting assets. The recording of depletion is a bookkeeping entry similar to depreciation and does not involve the expenditure of cash. Amortization. Gradually writing off the value of an intangible asset over a period of time. Commonly applied to items such as goodwill, improvements to leased premises, or expenses of a new stock or bond issue. Statement of Comprehensive Income. A financial statement which shows a company's revenues and expenditures resulting in either a profit or loss during a financial period. Straight line method. 
an accounting method of depreciation whereby an equal amount is charged each period as an expense when writing down the value of an asset over time. Declining balance method. An accounting method of depreciation whereby a fixed percentage is applied to the outstanding balance of an asset to determine the expense to be charged each period. Statement of cash flow. A financial statement which provides information as to how a company generated and spent its cash during the year. Assists users of financial statements in evaluating the company's ability to generate cash internally, repay debts, reinvest and pay dividends to shareholders. Capitalization or capital structure. The total dollar amount of all debt, preferred in common stock, and retained earnings of a company. This can also be expressed in percentage terms. Inventory. The goods and supplies that a company keeps in stock. A statement of financial position item. Prepaid expenses. Payments made by the company for services to be received in the near future. For example, rents, insurance premiums, and taxes are sometimes paid in advance. A statement of financial position item. Trade receivables. Money owed to a company for goods or services it has sold for which payment is expected within one year. A current asset on the statement of financial position. Weighted average method. An inventory valuation method calculated as the cost of goods available for sale divided by the number of units available for sale. First in, first out. FIFO. Inventory items acquired earliest are sold first. Share capital. The money paid in by shareholders and received by the company for the shares issued by the company. Retained earnings. The cumulative total of annual earnings retained by a company after payment of all expenses and dividends. The earnings retained each year are reinvested in the business. Non-controlling interest. The equity of the shareholders who do not hold controlling interest in a controlled company. 2. In consolidated financial statements, the item in the statement of financial position of the parent company representing that portion of the assets of a consolidated subsidiary considered as accruing to the shares of the subsidiary not owned by the parent. And the item deducted in the statement of comprehensive income of the parent and representing that portion of the subsidiary's earnings considered as accruing to the subsidiary's shares not owned by the parent. Non-current liability. Money owed but not due to be paid within a year. Non-current liabilities include long-term debt and deferred tax. Deferred tax liabilities. The income tax payable in future periods. These liabilities commonly result from temporary differences between the book value of assets and liabilities as reported on the statement of financial position and the amount attributed to that asset or liability for income tax purposes. Current liabilities. Money owed and due to be paid within a year, like accounts payable. A statement of financial position category. Trade payables. Money owed by a company for goods or services purchased, payable within one year. A current liability on the statement of financial position. Cost of sales. A statement of comprehensive income account representing the cost of buying raw materials that go directly into producing finished goods. Gross profit. The amount remaining after the cost of sales is subtracted from revenue. Share of profit of associates. A company's share of an unconsolidated subsidiary's revenue. The equity accounting method is used when a company owns 20 to 50% of a subsidiary. Cost method. Used when a company owns less than 20% of a subsidiary. Statement of changes in equity. A financial statement that shows the total comprehensive income kept in the business year after year. Control position. Ownership of sufficient voting stock in a company to materially affect its affairs. In all provinces except Manitoba, New Brunswick, and Quebec, A 20% holding is deemed to represent control. Reporting issuer. Usually, a corporation that has issued or has outstanding securities that are held by the public and is subject to continuous disclosure requirements of securities administrators. Continuous public disclosure. The act of a public corporation complying with continuous disclosure requirements set out by the relevant Provincial Securities Act. Material change. A change in the affairs of a company that is expected to have a significant effect on the market value of its securities. Takeover bid. An offer made to security holders of a company to purchase voting securities of the company which, with the offerer's already owned securities, will in total exceed 20% of the outstanding voting securities of the company. For federally incorporated companies, the equivalent requirement is more than 10% of the outstanding voting shares of the target company. Insider trading. Trading in a security by someone who has access to non-public material information. 